can tell by the heft of the packet. Now, beware, Mike, you are right next to the uh, speaker, so everything you say or breathe is going to come. Oh, he's moving. There he goes. There he goes. There he goes. Yeah, I'll right. keep on moving. As long as I got a padded chair, I'm fine. Tonight, we are going to be going through chapters six and seven, and we will be talking about such things as the opening of the first six seals, as well as what is known as the Great Tribulation. All right, and uh, as I always promise before we begin, I. Well, it's about time. <laughs> Packets right there, Sam Bill. Hey. Somebody's got to get the money. <laughs> that one was. Oh, okay, I thought that was the top. Oh, you can get a third one? I get here for one. Oh, okay. Or she already has. I get one. Man, Francis is getting covered by everybody. That's awesome. All right. Um, as I've promised every time I've started this, you're not going to get all your questions answered, and you'll probably have more when we finish. So uh, let's try to get through this as quickly as possible. Uh, try to have y'all out of here by by 7:15. All right, that's the goal. Let us begin, and would someone care to open us with a word of prayer? You might want to open with a word of prayer. Go ahead, Mike. <laughs> Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for your many blessings you've given us, Lord. Uh, the pretty weather we've had this week, Lord. And, and some more rain I hear is coming tomorrow, so we thank you for that as well. We thank you for this lesson we're about to learn, and, and Mike presenting it to us, and that we will be able to absorb and to comprehend the, what we're fixing to hear, Lord, and just understand your word and apply it to our lives. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. 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 All right, let's have some fun. <coughs> Our uh, first reading is Revelation chapter 6. And in case you're wondering, the version that I choose to read is usually the NIV version. Just because that's the version I preach from, and that's the version that I'm used to. But you may have a different translation. So I actually encourage you to go home after this and read this chapter from whatever version you usually read from. You may get a different perspective from it. All right? So we're going to go ahead and read the entire chapter. I watched as the Lamb opened the first of the seven seals. Then I heard one of the four living creatures say in a voice like thunder, Come. I looked, and there before me was a white horse. Its rider held a bow, and he was given a crown, and he rode out as a conqueror bent on conquest. When the Lamb opened the second seal, I heard the living creature say, Come. The second living creature. Then another horse came out, a fiery red one. Its rider was given power to take peace from the earth and to make people kill each other. To him was given a large sword. When the Lamb opened the third seal, I heard a third living creature say, Come. I looked, and there before me was a black horse. Its rider was holding a pair of scales in his hand. Then I heard what sounded like a voice among the four living creatures saying, Two pounds of wheat for a day's wage and six pounds of barley for a day's wage and do not damage the oil and the wine. When the lamb opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, Come. I looked, and there before me was a pale horse. Its rider's name was Death, and Hades was followed close behind him. They were given power over a fourth of the earth to kill by sword, famine, and plague and by the wild beasts of the earth. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and the testimony they had maintained. They called out in a loud voice, How long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood? Then each of them was given a white robe, and they were told to wait a little while longer until the full number of their fellow servants their brothers and sisters were killed just as they had been. I watched as he opened the sixth seal. There was a great earthquake. The sun turned black like sackcloth made of goat hair. The whole moon turned blood red, and the stars in the sky fell to earth as figs dropped from a fig tree when shaken by a strong wind. The heavens receded like a scroll being rolled up, and every mountain and island was removed 
from its place. Then the kings of the earth, the princes, the generals, the rich, the mighty, and everyone else, both slave and free, hid in caves among the rocks of the mountains. They called to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come. Who can withstand it? Not a good chapter to read before you want to go to bed at night, okay? But what we're going to find out is that there is actually quite a bit of uh, love in this chapter. may not seem like it, but there is a quite a bit of love in this chapter, and we're going to see why, all right? So there is no doubt that Jesus is the one uh, initiating this action. It says that the Lamb opens the seal. And the lamb that we have established is undoubtedly Jesus. Can everybody hear me? All right. Okay, all right. Are you going? Because I don't want you to lose your voice. No, I'm good. Okay. No, I don't lose my voice. Um, <laughs> okay. I'm good. Um, so we have the, I knew that was, I saw her, she was doing this, she was trying to be subtle. Oh, for the love of Mike, if you want me to turn off the AC, I can just oh, turn off the AC. Don't worry about it. Don't, no, no. It's well, okay. Sam Bill, we always know you're cold, so there's no. Yeah. It's just they know what to go there. Anybody, if anybody needs a robe, go get a robe. <laughs> just keep going. I can hear them. Do it at the same time. Okay, I'm just, I'm just waiting. <laughs> All right, let's get back to talking about Jesus, okay? So we have one of the four living creatures. Now, who remembers? Who are the four living creatures? That's right. They're around the throne room, right? They're around the throne room. These are angelic beings that, that are doing the will of God. Um, now, the first rider, it says, I looked, and there before me was a white horse. This rider held a bow. And he was given a crown, and he rode out as a conqueror bent on conquest. Now, there are two possible translations to who this might be. One is not a good translation. I wouldn't recommend following it. The other is, I think, the more accurate one. The first one is, some have said that this conqueror, in quotations, is Christ's ministry through the Gospels. And it is a, a rider on a white horse that represents the word of God going out into the world and bringing people to follow Jesus. Um, uh, the problem with that is that, and some have said even that this rider is Jesus. The problem with that is that Jesus has already been established as the lamb. Okay? So... Most scholars believe that this is the character within Revelation known as the Antichrist. Now let's, let's first establish what Antichrist means. Antichrist is anything or anybody that is actively trying to do harm or do the opposite of what Jesus wants. Antichrist was a common phrase used in first century Christianity to describe any uh, leader, any uh, movement that was trying to undermine the, the Christian church. So uh, when we think of Antichrist in the 21st century, we tend to think of a singular figure. Um, and and that, that imagery does come from Revelation. However, it's important to note that, that that term of Antichrist, which basically means the opposite or the antagonist of Christ, that was a term that was used regularly in first century Christianity. Okay? Yeah, yeah. Is it okay to ask questions? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. I want to know is this, if you pictured this as a, as a lamb, like with four legs and a bar? No, um, you, the lamb as in the lamb that was slaughtered, as in the lamb in the reference of the sacrificial lamb. But I'm talking about. It says he watched as the lamb opened the first of the seven seals. Now you'll notice that lamb is capitalized. Yes, I do. But I'm just saying, in my vision, it's hard for me to picture a lamb doing that. So I'm wondering it's, how you picture it. So the lamb being capitalized means it's referring to the title of lamb. So and it, the Jesus, title in the previous chapter I, I established. See, I yeah, yeah. Yeah. The previous I'm chapter right. established the lamb is Christ. I'm sorry. Okay? Yeah. All right, no worries. Um, so. Jesus' actions
actually warned of the Antichrist uh, in the Gospel of Matthew. And there's a section of the Gospel of Matthew where Jesus actually speaks authoritatively to a lot of the descriptive stuff that we hear within Revelation. You can go back and read it's Matthew 24, 3 through 5. Um, and it's actually often called the, the mini uh, the mini apocalyptic book in the Gospels. Jesus does a lot of foreshadowing there. Um, the other reason why this is most likely an Antichrist figure is because the, the writer acts only once the seal has been broken. He had to wait for the seal to be broken and for the, the lamb to give permission. And for, if it was Jesus, he wouldn't need to wait for anybody. Jesus would just go. He has the authority to do so. Um, it's, it's important to note that while this narrative alludes to the fact that God allows Satan or the Antichrist to act upon the earth, it doesn't mean he approves of what Satan or the Antichrist is doing. Final judgment can only occur once the whole world has been given a chance and choice to follow the authentic and true message of Jesus Christ. The Antichrist slash Satan represents the opposing view of Jesus. Free will, as we've talked about before, is the truest gift from God in that we are given the choice to follow God's pathway, the Lamb, or follow the pathway without God, Satan slash Antichrist. Okay? Now, the rider wears a crown and is armed with a bow. This is a, a rider that has been on conquest, not through word, not through, not through peace, not through love, but through what? War. He's a, he, he's a, he's a conqueror. Um, the bow was standard, symbol, uh, standard, uh, standard symbol for military power. Think about it this way. The bow and arrow at that point was the most uh, technologically advanced form of weaponry. You used to have to fight with swords. When the bow was invented, you were then able to shoot a projectile from a very far distance away and at a greater frequency than just having a spear and throwing one and you'd have to reach back and grab another spear and throw one or you have a sword. It allowed for, it, it changed the whole face of warfare on the planet because now instead of having to get close up to your enemy, you could stand from far back in the battlefield, shoot your arrow off and do damage before you even got close enough for the enemy to hit you with swords. That's another reason why the Israelites were so prolific at slings. And they were actually really good. A slingshot is not a uh, slingshot is not a simple toy. A slingshot is a deadly weapon, especially if you, you go, go home and Google uh, Jew, uh, Jewish slingshots or Israelite slingshots. You can see why Goliath died. Yes. Alright? You can see why he died. Okay. In my opinion, the white rider here signifies conquest and specifically military conquest. Now, this would ring true with the Jewish Christian audience because they would have been under the occupation and oppression of the Roman authorities at this time. They would have known what it was like to endure military conquest. The other reason why is you notice the, the, the rider had a crown, right? Did it say where he got the crown from? says he was given a crown, but did it say that the lamb gave him the crown? No. Did it say the angels gave him the crown? No. No, it says he was given a crown, and it was all lowercase. Remember, the capitalizations in the Bible usually is in the, the, the textual evidence is usually emphasis. So if there's usually a divine or God behind it, it's usually capitalized. All right? That's in our grammar. There was no such thing as capitalization back in the time of the Bible. All right, but when you see that in the Bible in our translations, that's to accent the difference between some common and something that's divine. Um, this can allude to the fact that the writer acts with authority of his own creation other than some authority or an authority outside of God. All right? Now, this horse is one of a series of four, and the other three have all to do with destruction, onslaught, war, judgment, and... and so much of it. A lot of this symbolism comes from the book of Zechariah. And that's a quote from a biblical scholar, Don Carson. So here's the conclusion, in my opinion. The white rider most likely represents a warlike and conquering figure that will bring about conflict and oppression throughout the land. This is a contrary figure to the way Christ entered into the world. All right? 
I don't go as far to say it, it, that it is the Antichrist or not, but it is certainly an influential authoritative figure that is going to bring about violence and chaos across the whole world. Okay? All right. Can we turn the air up, please? You're welcome. Don't ever say I didn't do anything for my church, okay? <laughs> All right, now we come to the second seal. A fiery red horse whose rider carries a large sword and is given power to take peace from the earth and make people kill each other. Now, many people have, have just simplified this to war, right? That all this is is war coming to the world. It's actually a little bit more complicated than that. And not even complicated, but it's, it's more expansive than that. Um, essentially what we're talking about is, is uh, total civil unrest and global conflict. Peace is being removed from the world. All right? The ability to be peaceful and coexist peacefully is being removed from the world by this writer. Um, peace upon the earth is removed and the world descends basically into anarchy. Now, during this time period, it would not be beyond the scope of, of, of reason for a first century Christian to not see that, yeah, the whole world is descending into anarchy. So let's just look at a period of a 30-year gap between 64 AD and 94 to 96 AD, all right? 64, you have the great fire of Rome, uh, in which is blamed on the Christians, and the first official Christian persecution begins in 64 AD. 67 AD, there's a military revolt in Judea, and constant battles going all over that region between Roman and Jewish rebels. Uh, 67 AD, the Apostle Paul is martyred. Same year, the Apostle Peter is martyred. Uh, uh, sorry, not martyred. Martyred. Uh, 68 AD, AD uh, Nero commits suicide, and there's a massive civil war throughout the Roman Empire. In 70 AD, the Judean revolt is quashed, the temple is sacked and destroyed, and Jerusalem ceases to exist as a nation. Jerusalem is obliterated. Uh, all, of the, all of the temple's inner sacred items are carried back to Rome as trophies. And in 73 AD, the final Jewish stronghold in Masada is destroyed and all its inhabitants commit suicide. In 79 AD, Mount Vesuvius erupts, burying the towns of Pompeii and Herculaneum and filling the air, filling the, the, the skies of that area in the Mediterranean world with darkness. And so you would have seen that eruption and the results of that eruption from miles and miles and miles away. And then uh, 93 AD through 96 AD, the, the widespread Christian persecution over the entire Roman Empire begins under the reign of terror under domination. All right? Some believe that God, so let's come back to the, the idea that maybe this is a future event. Some believe that God in his mercy has imposed a kind of peace upon the earth that limits destructive power of human beings when all, uh, kind of limits how much war can happen. <clears throat> kind of the concept of cooler heads prevail, right? This peace would be removed. And basically human beings would be given over to their warlike nature and their conflict, the, the very conflicted nature. Um, so... The, Essentially, instead of really saying that the that this rider, the, the red rider, uh, is war, it's actually a better place to say the red rider is a removal of peace. I know that seems somatic, but it, it's actually important because it's not you know it's not war in the sense of battles. It's literally the peace that we all know, the peace to coexist with each other, the peace to talk to someone, all that being removed, and the world is just thrown into conflict. Okay? Any questions? That sounds pretty familiar. We, well, it's going to get worse. Yes. So. Yeah. We still having fun? Everybody still having fun? Yeah. Okay. Right. Looking for the love. <laughs> Looking for the love? You, you, we've already, already talked about a little of it. We'll see you in a minute. So, all right. A black horse with a rider holding a pair of scales. Now, these are not scales of justice. All right? This is not scales of justice, contrary to what some people may, may have said. 
These are specifically scales for weighing out <coughs> money or, and, and determining the quantities of food. It's the same thing as going to the grocery store and putting a thing of bananas on the, on the weight on the scale and determining how much it costs. Now what's interesting uh, that they shout two pounds of wheat for a day's wage and six pounds of barley for a day's wage and do not damage the oil and wine. What, what does that look like? A day's wage at that time was a denarius, which would be the equivalent of $50 a day in our money, all right? A day's wage was 50, is, would be like someone giving us a $50 bill for today's wage. Now that would, could probably be adjusted more to 80 nowadays, um, but 50 was one of the one I stuck with. So think of it in this way. What this is meaning is that there's great inflation of money, a great inflation of prices, and food shortages. So just think about this for a second. Today, a two pound bag of wheat flour costs $2.98. If it tomorrow costs $50, that would be an inflation rate of 1,577.85%, all right? Which essentially means you're not gonna be able to afford the basic commodities unless you've got a lot, a lot of money. Food prices become astronomically high, which usually means that food is scarce and famine is occurring. Now, in the ancient time during times of luxury, you would not use scales to weigh out flour. You would just kind of guesstimate because there was so much of it, okay? It'd be like, ah, it looks like two pounds here, take your money and go. But during times of famine, you were very meticulous about your, because you only had so much. You only had so much. Now, what's even more di disturbing about this, two pounds of wheat was enough to feed one person per day. This is a society where who is the person who usually works and who's the one who stays home and takes care of the family? The man works. Well, the man works, the woman takes care of the home. So you have one provider for the family. You know, and these are bigger families back then. You had multiple children. But what this is saying is that one day's wage is only gonna be enough to pay for one person to eat dead. Which means now they're gonna have to start determining who goes hungry and who uh, gets to eat. Who starves, who's fed, who lives, who dies, okay? Um, Barley was usually the cheaper grain because barley, you bought barley and you actually ground it up. You had to do the grinding, all right? You had to do a lot of the work yourself and it was much more coarse bread. It was a much more harder to, 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 to digest. But now it seems barley is more expensive than wheat. And what that is an allusion to is that if you're poor, you're gonna have an even harder time to survive. Now, it says here, do not damage the oil and wine. This may allude to God setting limits on the degree of destruction. God will not allow all substance upon the earth to be destroyed. Olive trees and grapevines have very deep root systems, which means that they usually would be the last to feel effects of famine and, and drought, okay? But here's the point I want you to remember. Who is it that sets food prices? Who is it that controls the output and distribution of food? Anybody want to take a guess? Authorities. <laughs> Most famines, though absolutely lack of resources is the number one cause of famines, the cause of death is the poor allocation of those resources, all right? It's, it's basically not pooling your resources together and being fair with everyone. It's trying to, it's hoarding food, it's gouging prices, it's uh, determining who gets food and who doesn't get food. All of that is usually up to authorities or people in charge. Most of the famine of this famine's effects are actually caused by how the food is distributed and who can afford to purchase it. The suffering is not caused by God, but by humanity's inability to work with one another and to support one another. 
which is another allusion to peace collapsing upon the earth. All right? So conclusion, the black horse and its rider represent famine and food shortages exasperated by unfair pricing and unfair distribution. Okay? Now we come to the fourth seal, a pale horse. Now there is very little need for me to try to go into great depth of what the pale horse is. Pale horse is death. All right? Pale, in this description in the biblical world, was the description of a corpse. So essentially, this is a corpse riding a horse. All right? Um, a, a, or the horse itself it resembles a corpse and, and the rider. Um, a fourth of society dies. A fourth of society falls victim to all of these shortcomings. In today's number, that would be a total of 200 million people. Just think about in that. In the world? In the entire world, 200 million people. Because there are currently 8.1 billion people in the world. A fourth of that is roughly about 200 million. Okay? Killed by wild beasts. By the way, at this time, lions still existed in the Middle East. I don't know if you knew that, that lions existed at this point. But what this actually refers to is that the population is shrinking so rapidly that animals are actually moving back into unpopulated areas. All right? That basically animals... Nature's starting to take over because humanity's just not around anymore. It's Two, not... 200 million is a, is a fourth of eight. Well, it's probably not. Eight. I probably did bad math there, but... Yeah, that's, uh, that's way off. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be... A fourth is going to be about two billion. I, then I, I, should, I missed the zero, so put two billion. Two Cross billion. out the end, yeah. sorry. I thought that didn't look right, because when I was like, wait a minute, a fourth of that, yeah, that's... Okay. No. Hey, I caught hey. it pretty quick, I didn't yeah. Hey, he was A and M. Yeah, he, I did. Yeah, Matt. Was <laughs> so, uh, okay, so two billion. All right, you feel better now? Two billion doesn't make that's me feel much better. People, that's a lot of that's people. That's a lot of people. That's a lot of people. I'm not going. Okay. So, <laughs> so let's let's look at this. We have a warlike conqueror, war and conflict, or the absence of peace, famine and food shortage, death as a result of these issues. And here's what I want you to leave with this before we go to the fifth seal. It is worth noting that all of these sufferings are brought on by people refusing to live in accordance with God's command to love thy neighbor. All of it. All of it stems from people giving into warlike nature, giving into profiting nature, giving into it's us versus them nature as opposed to following the gospel. The world itself is literally descending into selfish, uh, self-serving practices, okay? Um, these are not issues brought on by God as punishment. These are issues being brought upon humanity by their own disobedience to God's commands. They are the consequences of disobedience. God doesn't essentially have to punish at this point because people are going to punish themselves by, simply diso by simple disobedience. The riders and horses are merely the result of what happens when people refuse to rely upon the teaching of Christ and seek their own methods of validation. Okay? What's fascinating about all this is you don't see God doing any of it. He hasn't removed free will. He has not removed free will. Human beings are still allowed to act in accordance with the gospel at this time. So hear the message. What has happened is that God is allowing these forces to be enacted upon the earth by their own free will and basically let the world do what it does. Okay? All right. Fifth seal. The souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and the testimony they had maintained. These are those who have lost their lives in the pro <coughs> proclamation and declaration of the gospel. They're martyrs. They're Christian martyrs. Um, historians have recorded that in the first 300 years of church history, there were 10 officially sanctioned persecutions of Christianity. The world, just as the world sought to kill Jesus when he first came out of the womb, the world sought to destroy Christianity in its, its first 300 years. So y'all, it's a miracle that we are literally sitting where we are right now. It is by God's own divine precedent and purpose that we are where we are and that Christianity wasn't wiped out. Um, 
You have to remember there were other messianic groups that formed during that time period and Rome destroyed them. Rome killed their Messiah and then the religion fell apart and their followers dispersed. Christianity, and hear me when I say this, Christianity is the only religion in world history, in the history of creation, where the Messiah or the head of the church was killed and then the church grew faster and larger after the death of the Messiah. Okay? It's not, it, 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 it hasn't happened. It doesn't happen. Okay? Muhammad was not a Messiah. He was a prophet. Never claimed to be a Messiah. All right? Buddha, never claimed to be God. Confucius, never claimed to be God. Jesus claimed to be God. And he had a small following. And then after he died, he had a massive following. And it is now still the largest and most rapidly growing religion in the world. It's never happened before, it hasn't happened since. Just sit on that for a little bit. So, in a loud voice we hear, How long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until your, you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood? And each of them was given a white robe, and they were told to wait a little longer. The residents of heaven and the martyrs are wanting God to enact justice on their behalf and on creation's behalf. They have watched the church suffer persecution throughout its history. And throughout this time, people have been martyred in the name of Jesus. They've been sent up into the kingdom of God. And these are people wanting justice. These are people wanting God to go and do something about it. God, stop it. Stop this. It's time for you to go in. It's time for you to end everything. Put him to the sword. Put him to the torch. It's time. And God says the most loving thing that God often says, wait, I haven't given up on the world yet. I won't let them take all the food. I won't let them kill everyone. I won't let them kill themselves. I haven't given up on my creation yet. It's not time yet. Which goes back then to show it is not our place to determine when, where, and how God should show justice. It's our purpose to put faith in the fact that God will one day show true justice. So if you want to know where the love is in Revelation, all of the violence, all of the chaos, all of the, of the, of the bloodshed, all comes from humanity's inability to follow the gospel. And God the entire time is saying, wait, 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 wait. We're not going yet. I'm not going in yet. There's still hope. There's still good. There's still people there that can receive the gospel. And it's only when, as we will find later, it's only when the, there is no chance whatsoever for the message of Jesus to reach anyone's ears. That's when God goes, okay. That's called love. That's called love. All right, opening the sixth seal. <coughs> oh, by the way, just that past phrase. Remember that. Things happen on God's time, not our time. Just another quick reminder here. So you open the, si the opening of the sixth seal, we have a great earthquake that erupts across the world uh, that affects everything. Lunar cycles, tides. Uh, talks about mountains falling in on itself, islands sinking. This is this is a cataclysmic climate disaster. All right, meteors falling from the sky. Um, now you may have thought that why did it say goat hair? Black is goat hair. Well, remember you're a 21st century audience. You don't really deal with goat hair all that much. At this time period, there was a very very particular breed of goat that had a very black coat. And so that, that was used to make very dark clothing. So if you would have had sackcloth from that, that goat, you would have had, you know, it would have covered things. And if you put it up in your door, it would cover up light. So again, we got to not think as a 21st century person, we got to think as a first century Christian when we're reading a lot of this. Earthquakes are usually used in scripture to describe God's visitation upon the earth. Okay? All right. To just, to just basic
basically wrap up the rest of it. Um, everyone on Earth is being affected by this. Nobody's escaping it. Okay, everybody's being affected by it. This is a worldwide event that's going on. And uh, people are fleeing, not from the disasters, but from God. They're fleeing, they're saying, you know, we can't escape this, we know. And, and what's interesting about that is it shows that the people are, are fearful of God, and yet you don't see any of them crying out for mercy. They're just hiding from God. Now, who's a famous biblical character that tried to hide from God? Jonah. Jonah. How'd that work for Jonah? <clears throat> Not well. Not well. <laughs> Did Jonah learn his lesson after God showed him grace? Yeah. Did he? Mm -hmm. Well, he got angry the lesson. Well, he... He, went and did what he, he did saying. what God told him to do, but did he really did he really understand what was going on? He just understood that he didn't approve of it. He didn't approve of it, but obviously he didn't learn the lesson of God's grace. Otherwise, he would have recognized it within himself. We all fall into the danger of instead of pursuing God in a humble way and in a, a way of asking for forgiveness. Instead, we hide from God and we refuse to acknowledge that there could be sin within our lives. All right? We refuse to, we hide from God because we don't want to accept the fact that there could be things within our lives that we don't want to fix or that we don't want to view as possibly sinful. Okay? These are people hiding from God because they fear the judgment of God. All right? True Christians know and those who know that the, the grace is something that is given by a gift shouldn't fear judgment because the, the price has already been paid by Jesus Christ. All right? So again, this is another shadowing of just how bad things are getting on earth. Okay? Um, kings and princes are mentioned not necessarily because they're the worst human beings in the world, but because they usually normally feel secure, that their money and their power secures them. When this happens, it doesn't matter how rich or poor you are, life's not going to be fun. Okay? All right. Any questions? Yeah, fine. Okay, so we've been talking about this for, what, five weeks now. Are we at the point, are we, and I've got to ask this question, are we uh, getting into the rapture? Are we before the rapture? I mean, okay. I don't really want to. No, 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 you're fine, you're fine. But, I mean, what time frame are we So I to? think the different way of, of viewing that, <clears throat> yeah. because the rapture itself is a 20th century creation. The term rapture came out of the late 1800s and early 1900s. Rapture itself was this concept of part of the tribulation, part of this time was being Christians called up. Um, that's a singular view on how to interpret the scripture. Um, but it's not all of them. We're going to look over that, those in a minute. But the actual term rapture is not used in scripture. That's a, that's a 19th century to 20th century term. Now, the better way to put this is, are we stepping from a more of a historical uh, description to more of a happening in the future description, happening as a prophetic uh, type of, of situation, then yes, I think we're, he we're heading more on the prophetic side of things. Um, mainly because it's talking about final judgment. And, and obviously that hasn't happened yet, otherwise we're in a lot of trouble. Just going to tell you that right now. But um, we'll, we'll get into more in this next chapter of, of kind of what you're, what you're referring to. Okay? All right. All right. After this, I saw four angels standing in the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth to prevent any wind from blowing on the land or on the sea or in any tree. Then I saw another angel coming up from the east, having the seal of the living God. He called out in a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to harm the land and the sea. Do not harm the land or sea or the trees until we put a seal on the foreheads of the servants of our God. This little side note here, again, that, that is a reminder that there are still people on earth who are receiving the grace of Christ. How else are they going to get the seal on their head if they aren't, if they aren't professing their belief in Christ? We'll get to that in a minute. Then I heard the number of those who were sealed. 
144,000 from all the tribes of Israel. I'm not going to read all the tribes of Israel. It's just 12,000 from each tribe. After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing right robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. All the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. They fell down on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen. Praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength to be our God forever and ever. They're worshiping God. That's what's happening. All right? Then one of the elders asked me, These in white robes, who are they and where did they come from? By the way, that's what you call a biblical rhetorical question. All right? John answered, Sir, you know. And the elders said, These are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter with them in his presence. Never again will they hunger, never again will they thirst. The sun will not be down on them, nor any scorching heat, for the Lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to the springs of life, of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. So before we get to the seventh seal, which will come next week, there is a pause. God stops everything. He literally tells the angels, hold back the winds, stop. There's something we have to do first. All right, before we go any further. And uh, the four winds, four corners of the earth, that's a biblical concept. You can find that in, in the Old Testament. And a seal of the living God is put on their foreheads. Now, I don't want to give too much away. But there are there is another marking that will come later in the Bible, in, in Revelation. <coughs> This is the first, and what I would call the true marking. All right, this is the marking of the seal. All right, and God, the seal of God. Um, do you ever wonder why uh, on on Ash Wednesday we put the cross on our foreheads, or if we anoint someone, we anoint their forehead, or if we baptize a baby, we baptize it by putting water on their forehead? Anybody want to take a guess? What you see first? Nope. Nope. Well, it is a it goes back to the time of the Jews it was a it was a, a marking of the forehead is a universally recognized sign within the Jewish and Christian community of God's ownership over that person you are marked as part of God's family all right it's the same reason why we why the Jews anointed their doors with the lamb's blood it was a sign of God's protection, all right? And think about it. It's actually a brilliant place because what's behind your forehead? Your brain, your brain right? Where does all your cognitive stuff come from? Your brain, all right? Where does all your concept of, of how we know God? The brain. So that's more of a 21st century view, but uh, I just had to throw that in there. Now, we can get really obsessed with the number 144,000. And here's what I want you to do. Don't. Don't obsess over that specific number. A lot of revelation is symbolism, all right? There is not going to be literally only 144,000 people who go to heaven, all right? And if you'll notice and pay attention, it actually says there's 144,000 sealed, and then there's the great multitudes, all right? These are just the ones that are brought out of the tribulation, okay? Which, by the way, the previous time span that we've just been experiencing, that's called the tribulation, all right? This that whole time span. So the, the term tribulation, that is a biblical term, all right? That, so if you ever see, you know, scholars using the term tribulation and you're wondering who is that, no, that's a biblical term. It comes from Revelation. Now, those yeah. are Jews, 144. So there's different frames of thought on that, all right? There's different frames of thought on that, but, but you're, you're on the right path. Okay, so you hear, and I don't know if this is what you're being like the tribulation, but it's more, we hear about, you know, we, we have, the whole putting the image eyes have gone. Yes. Is that an actual thing? Is that, that so that's where the rapture yeah. concept comes right. into. So, so in the New Testament, 
there is the description of the coming of judgment or the coming the return of Christ happening in a sudden fashion. And, and you can see that in two ways. You can see it in either an actual time way, as in like one minute you're here, the next minute you're gone, one second you're here, the next second you're gone. Or you can look at merely as a descriptive notion that they're trying to convey that, hey, this could happen at any time and you need to be aware of it. All right? Christian scholars and, and very devout theologians have disagreed on this. There's, there's really no, uh, between those two frames of thought, you, you don't really have much problem. All right, you can kind of argue scripturally for both, for both points. That's where the term rapture came from. Uh, biblical scholars in the, in the 1800s and 1900s were trying to figure out a term that would be used to describe that sudden uptaking of, of, of followers or the sudden uh, drawing of God's people to himself. And so they came up with rapture. That's, that's the term. But the actual term rapture doesn't appear in scripture. So yeah. it's, it's one of the reasons why, you know, you, you, I try to preface that because, again, we're dealing with, whenever Jesus uses those references or Paul, they're usually using it in parable form. And so he's not, he may not essentially be describing exactly something happening, but just describing how it could happen or how, how an image of the way it could happen, like a thief coming in the night. Does that literally mean that there's going to be a thief coming to your house, or does that just mean, hey, you need to be watchful as if a thief was coming, right? Why do you put alarm on your house? Because there could be a thief coming. Okay, so to be clear, Scripture doesn't ever specifically say that for sure the believers are immediately taken. It alludes, it alludes to, and again, and that's a very hard question to answer, it, it alludes in various different forms of, in some cases, people being immediately drawn up, and drawn up isn't really reality. It's actually, some, at some point they're there, at some point they're not. It talks about Jesus coming as a thief in the night, and to be aware of it, and, and it's referencing the same thing. With those two descriptions, we can get obsessed over whether or not we're actually going to be drawn up immediately, when I think the overarching message is, be ready. Be ready. This is not something that just, you know, not something to take lightly. And that, Stephanie kind of hit on my question. I mean, I used the term rapture. But yeah, yeah. I meant tribulation, I mean, as well. I, yeah. I realize rapture is not in the Bible, but uh, basically, are we going to be part of this period here? Are we going to be called home? Yeah, I mean, it doesn't matter if you're a believer, regardless, no. you're covered, but I understand that. So, but are we going to experience some of the hardships that so we're talking? Or we're going to answer that. The, the bigger answer is I don't know. The, 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 the true answer is I don't know. There are different ways to think about it. Um, but Scripture doesn't tell us essentially, you know, John doesn't, doesn't say, hey, yes, you will experience this. It's, it's again, it's revelation. So uh, we could, we could, we could not. We'll, we'll look at the different yeah, things here. There's like pre trip post trip Yeah, and I, trip, trip. We're almost, we're almost there. We're almost there, okay? Yeah, we're almost there. And then I'll tell you and then I'll tell you the Methodist view. Alright? Okay. <laughs> so we kind of talked about it. Twelve thousand, I don't know if you knew this. Some have said that the one hundred and forty four thousand could represent the army that God is going to use to fight the forces of evil at some point when there's a great battle between good and evil in heaven. And there's some, there is actually some credibility to that because 12,000 was a military number. It was to determine military units uh, within the Judean army, okay? So basically like army corps. And so uh, that would make sense that the 12 tribes, 12,000, some believe that it is literally 12,000 Jews that will convert to Christianity. Um, the, again, that's, that's, there's no reason not to believe that, except that there's a lot of symbolism that goes along. And it doesn't say, um, you know, again, it could be, it could be open to interpretation. Uh, there is one tribe missing, the tribe of Dan. The tribe of Dan is replaced with the tribe of Ephraim. That makes a lot of sense when you look at the history of the tribe of Dan. The tribe of Dan was the tribe that brought idolatry into the Israelite nation. And they had a constant problem with idolatry. And it states that the Antichrist, later in the 
in the book that the Antichrist comes from the tribe of Dan. All right? Now, again, that doesn't necessarily mean that it comes from the Jewish tribe of Dan. What it means is that it comes from a place of, ideal, of idolatry. All right? When you look at the symbolic way of it. Okay. Um, the multitudes, the elder explains it, tells us exactly who, who they are. These are those who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. We've got five minutes left, and I'm going to try to get us through the definition of tribulation. Okay? The great tribulation is actually mentioned by Jesus. He talks about it in what is known as the Olivet Discourse as a sign that would occur in the times of the, at the end time. It appears in all of the synoptic gospels. Remember, synoptic means timeline or narrative. John is theology, uh, theological. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are narrative and chronological. Both Matthew, Mark, and Luke record this statement or these sayings of Jesus warning his followers that they will suffer tribulation and persecution before the ultimate triumph of the kingdom of God. Christians disagree. I could just leave it there, but I'll go a little further. Christians disagree over whether the tribulation will be a relatively short period of great hardship before the end of the world and second coming of Christ. That's known as futurism. Or has already occurred, having happened in AD 70 when Roman legions laid siege to Jerusalem and destroyed its temple. This is called preterism. Preterism. All right? Which essentially, preterism is the belief that what is being described in Revelation is what happened to the Jews during the time of Nero's persecution and the destruction of Israel. I don't think there's a lot of evidence for that one, but it's legitimate, and, and people can, can, can lie. Here's where things get really confusing and where Christians drive me absolutely up the wall. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read the different views, and then I'll tell you what I think is the most important view to have. Okay? All right. Pre-tribulationists believe that all righteous Christians, deceased and living, will be taken bodily up to heaven, they refer to that as the rapture, before the tribulation begins. Pre-wrath tribulationists believe the rapture will occur during the tribulation, Halfway through or after, but before the seven bowls of the wrath of God are poured out. By the way, we haven't gotten to the bowls yet. I'm sorry. Mid-tribulationists believe that the rapture will occur halfway through the tribulation, but before the worst part of it occurs. Post-tribulationists believe that Christians will not be taken up into heaven for eternity, but will be received or gathered in the air by Christ to descend together to establish a kingdom of God on earth at the end of the tribulation. And then you have the preterist view, which is basically the tribulation has already taken place during the time of Israel. Christian preterists believe that the tribulation was a divine judgment visited upon the Jews for their sins, including rejection of Jesus as the promised Messiah. It occurred entirely in the past, around AD 70, when the armed forces of the Roman Empire destroyed Jerusalem and its temple. And that eventually Jesus will return one day, but that the tribulation has already occurred. Okay? It is a historical time in the past. Here's what I want to leave you with before I get to the methods. None of that is essential for salvation. Okay? You can be a Christian preterist. You can be a Christian futurist. You can believe in the post-tribulation, pre-tribulation, post-pre-modern tribulation, idolbada, flabba, lava, da, bada, revelation. You can, you can be a Baptist post-tribulationist, a Methodist pre-tribulationist, a, a Catholic preterist. If you believe that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, you're not going to have to worry about it one way or the other. Okay? And what often I get asked is, where do Methodists stand on this whole concept? John Wesley seemed to bounce around in his beliefs. Some days he was a post-tribulationist. Some days he was a pre-tribulationist. 
He never was a preterist, but he, he, he believed the tribulation was coming, but he would go back and forth. And eventually, he settled on the reality that it really didn't matter. The more important reality was to live each day as Christ's representative on earth, serving God's people and spreading Christ's message. There is too much to be done in the present to worry about the future. There's a difference between awareness and obsession. Think about how many debates Christians have had with each other over whether the tribulation has happened, will happen, is going to happen, is happening right now, will happen in 10 years, when we could have been deciding what's the best way to spread the gospel to people. Right? How long do we spend arguing whether Jonah was actually swallowed by a fish? Was he swallowed by a whale? Was he actually swallowed? Was he just there for, was it all symbolism? Or what's the bigger story there? Did God literally create the earth in seven 24-hour days? Or was it seven days that was actually a symbol for seven million, billion, trillion years? Did God create the world with pre-existing age? You ever thought of that? That if the grand creator of things could create something, he could create something that had age to it? Right? We can spend all that time arguing, what's the big picture? What's the main point? He created. He created. Exactly. He created. Revelation is a warning to be aware. <coughs> not to be fearful, not to be obsessed, but to be aware. Okay? So if you go home tonight, and you find out that you're a post-tribulationist or a pre-tribulationist or a pre or you don't know what the heck you are and your head hurts and you just want to crawl into bed and, and go to sleep. Guess what? As long as when you go to sleep, you believe that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, you don't need to worry about it. Yeah. All right? Any questions? Right, once, going twice. <laughs> 717. All right. <laughs> Y'all have a great week and may God be with you to a meeting. Throne that is whiter than snow. In a city that is made of gold. Poor land of